My research essentially focuses on understanding people's experiences with new forms of technology and new approaches to education. So all of my research applies to education. Um, I usually focus on higher education. Uh, some are, of our work applies to K-12. We have a grant from the National Science Foundation that, um, that focuses on K-12, but the majority of it is on higher ed in particular. And we study, um, we study we, I say that we study people. Essentially what we do is we um, interact with students and faculty to understand what is it that they do, uh, why they do the things that they do, and, um, and what are their experiences while they're engaging um, in the, those things. So for example, um, online education, right? It's just a very simple example. Um, when you um, are encouraged by your institution to create a MOOC, for example, what motivates you to do that, right? Why, why would you do that? Um, what are your aspirations, your challenges, and so on? So those are kind of the questions that we start with. Um, and we use those questions to then go on and design better learning environment and better learning experiences. So part of the goal of our research is to figure out how to design better learning environments. Um, and we do that by conducting the research, but by also engaging in a process that we call design-based research. So essentially what it is that we do is we figure out in certain situations that there might be a problem, right? And then we design a solution for it, we study that solution, um, and then we refine the, the solution, the intervention. Um, and we study it again, and then over time we improve that and try it in different environments. So I really want to understand people. I think that's kind of the basic foundation of our research, right? Uh, understand what, what is their lived experience, right? You sit in a course, what is it like? Um, how can we make it better, right? So I think that's kind of the grounding. Um, and. To that, we pull from a lot of disciplines. So my doctorate is in uh, learning technologies, which is a field that's influenced by the learning sciences and, um, and instructional design. So the uh, kind of instructional design field has been a big influence in the sense of, so instructional design is a problem solving discipline, right? So you have a problem, how would you solve it? Um, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm fascinated by that. Um, but I'm also, so it's a, it's a pragmatic discipline in a lot of ways. Uh, at the same time, um, you know, very sociological theories and human computer interaction theories have informed our work. Um, in the past, I used to do research on how, what people's experiences are when they interact online with, uh, with virtual characters and chatbots. So a lot of that was influenced by the, was, I'm grounded in the human computer interaction literature and essentially this piece, this body of literature that said that computer human interactions approximate human human interactions. So a lot of our work was trying to understand where that was the case and where uh, computer human interactions differed than human human interactions. Our research is very multidisciplinary. Um, we draw from a lot of um, a lot of disciplines, I suppose, um, both to understand um, people and their experiences with uh, technology and education, but also to um, to design the environments that we design. And our research methods are very diverse, so we're very pragmatic. We um, we don't just you know, use qualitative data, for example, and use methods associated with that to draw inferences. But we, we do, we use any sort of method that allows us to ask the questions um, that we want to learn more about. We have a large multidisciplinary team that works on, on this project or on, on all of our of design-based projects. Um, and that team usually consists of content experts. So for example, in our computer science course, 
We have computer science faculty and uh, computer science teachers. We have instructional and learning designers. Uh, we have media developers and then we have researchers, right? So we all um, collaborate on the design, um, but then we spend uh, most of our time doing, you know, the, um, kind of the area of our expertise or the area that needs to be done that we need to kind of take a lead on. So, for example, we have, um, we have an award uh, from the National Science Foundation that has allowed us to create a dual credit computer science course. So this course is for high school students um, and it enables them to get credit for college. Uh, it's an introductory computer science course. It, uh, it teaches students um, kind of the, what is possible with computing, right? It's not just a coding course that is so, and that's what traditionally is an intro computer science course. This is a course that teaches them about algorithms, it teaches them some coding, it teaches them of how computing is pervasive in our day-to-day -day life and so on. Um, so there's various problems that we try to address with that course. The first problem was that most computer science courses are coding courses and that's not what computer science is. Um, the second prob problem is that there's a lack of um, representation of uh, women and other minorities in computer science. So we tried to create a course that would be appealing to a large uh, segment of the population, diverse segment of the population. And then the third problem is that um, computer science um, could use more innovative um, pedagogical methods. So this course embeds a lot of that in it. So for example, it's a modular course and every module starts by posing a problem to the students and says, um, here's a problem, how would you solve it with computing? Um, one example is that the first module, in the first module, someone takes over someone's identity. So the task of the students is to figure out who stole their identity, right? So they analyze data trails and, uh, and things that the identity thief left behind to figure out who it is. Having a researcher on the team is important to really explore how the course can be more effective, uh, more efficient, more engaging, more, more just in a lot of ways, right? Um, so instructional design usually focuses on efficiency, effectiveness, and engagement. In our research, we propose that uh, there's two other indicators of good, good instruction or good learning, and those are um, socially just instruction and, um, and transformational instruction. So these latter two have to do with. So let me give you an example to illustrate uh, socially just instruction. Um, a course might be effective, it might teach what it's supposed to teach to people. Uh, it might do it efficiently, right, and it might be engaging. But it might exclude large segments of the population. So it might be a sexist course, right? Um, so that's one indicator that we've added. And the second one we added in order to encourage people to kind of aspire uh, and to higher outcomes, to get people to think more about, well, how can this course have a great impact on someone's life? How could we develop this course so that a person can change the way that they look at the world, at the discipline, uh, that two years down the road they would look back to that course and think that course had an impact on me. Um, so studying those things and understanding those things allows us to improve that particular course, but also allows us to improve you know, future courses in the discipline or in general. One of our projects looked at a new um, technology that was integrated at the college level. Um, it was basically a social, an online social network the idea was that that would replace the learning management system at the college. Um, we wanted students to have interactions with each other in different courses outside of their course shells. 
So we created this platform based on open source environment that allowed people to be in a central space, but then access you know, their different courses. Um, and it looked kind of like Facebook, but it wasn't. Uh, it's called ELG. Um, and then other, uh, other universities also use it. So as we were, inter as we were you know, deploying that project, we became really interested in the faculty experience. People's experiences with other social networks came to shape how they viewed this social network. So people came to expect that this thing was going to function like Facebook because they had experience with Facebook and that was kind of the social network they had experience with at the time. Um, and then they would get really frustrated when it wasn't as you know, stable or um, they wasn't doing the things that they were expecting that it was going to do. So, you know, these expectations that they had of other tools that they had used in their instruction kind of shaped how they were using this tool. Yeah, that was really fascinating. Um, at the same time, the learning management systems that they used uh, shaped <laughs> some of their expectations. So, then you know, we had a lot of people come and say, well, where am I going to put my readings? It's like, that's, that's what I use my learning management system for. Um, so, so, how are we going to do that? To make change in education, I think we need a lot of different people thinking together, working together, but also working separately. So I don't think that we can shape the future of education um, just by writing about it, but I also don't think that we can shape it just by developing things. So just to give you an example, um, there's a lot of people developing educational technology products um, that are you know, becoming very popular, for example, that are not grounded on any well-formed understanding of education, of educational theory, of the challenges that teachers are facing in the classroom. Um, they're, you know, they might be engaging or beautiful products, but they might not allow teachers to, you know, do creative things. Like there's a number of um, applications um, or iPhone apps that essentially allow teachers to take attendance. I mean, how many attendance apps do you need, right? Um, but these people that are creating these products are, um, you know, they have expertise in that domain, right? And um, by either better understanding education themselves or by partnering with education researchers, they can identify significant problems that the field is facing that they could develop interventions for. Um, so, at the same time, we need people to consider and critique the, these products, right? And uh, the work that a lot of people are doing in the field. Um, I'm really excited that more and more people outside of education are interested about education, right? Um, but honestly, some of those solutions are not, they're not what we need. Um, and I think by not just working with them to develop better products, but also helping them understand um, the history of education, the history of educational technology, um, I think we could do great things. But there has been more and more of large-scale initiatives that require the involvement of a researcher to, um, to examine um, these initiatives, right? So for example, um, at the University of Texas in Austin, there was a course transformation program. And the idea was to refine um, large entry-level courses, to redesign them, and then look at how to improve them, right? So when you take a course that has 500 people in it, uh, three sections, semester after semester, you know, and create something new, you need a large team to do that. Uh, and the researcher could come in and design different, um, different data collection tools and approaches to understand you know, kind of the five things that I mentioned before, right? Is this effective? 
um, does this allow us to um, get so better outcomes, have those better outcomes in kind of a more efficient way? Uh, is this course engaging? Is it just? Is it is it empowering? Right. So, um, so that involvement I think is is both worthwhile, um, but it's also very interesting from my perspective because that could inform you know other courses at the at that particular institution, but also it could inform the scholarly community into you know, various aspects that uh, researchers are interested about. So in trying to figure out of the end result of the research and trying to en envision what that should look like. Yeah, we need to start at the, at the question level, right? So um, there's a scholarly interest and then there's pragmatic interests and then um, there's you know, areas in between where those two meet. And I think that Getting together with education researchers and um, really pinning down that question is one of the most significant parts of um, of this process. And you know that question usually can look at so researchers can look at a lot of things. Uh, so I'm personally interested in people's experiences, right? So asking things like what is it like to do X? So what is it like to read your textbook as a digi on a digital device? Um, what is it like to teach a MOOC? Like what does that really mean, right? Um, what is, you know, how do people um, understand interactions with, other, with others on these kind of global platforms that we have today. You know, why do faculty go online and, you know, s share their research on their blogs when there's no incentive to do so from the institution? Like, why do you spend that time? Right? Um, so I think to formulate those questions, we need to look at the literature and see, okay, which of these questions have been answered in the past? And uh, what do current researchers say that we still need to learn more about? Um, and I think having those conversations in kind of an interdisciplinary group is really significant as well because um, you know, your data scientist or your qualitative researcher could you know, poke holes into various arguments or describe, you know, an amazing new data collection strategy that allows you to ask the questions that you couldn't ask in the past. 